Hello, everyone. My guest today is Ed Bullion. He started an exotic car company out of his dorm room at Virginia Tech and then was director of sales at Lamborghini Atlanta for six years. In 2016, he founded VinWiki with a team of developer friends as a way to crowdsource vehicle history and empower stakeholders. He also holds the Cannonball Run world record. We'll talk more about that in a second. Ed, are you ready to take us to the top? I sure am. Thank you for having me. So what is the Cannonball Run world record? I'm sorry. It's Georgia Tech, not Virginia Tech. Sorry, Georgia Tech. But what is the Cannonball World Record? So Cannonball Run is not just a 1981 movie. It was actually an event that was organized by Brock Yates, a car and driver magazine in the 1970s. And it stopped in 1979 with some kind of continuation events. But now it's just idiots like me that go out and try to see how fast we can drive. So In 2013, I set the world record driving from New York to Los Angeles in 28 hours, 50 minutes. And and so what was like the average, you know, mile per hour? That's 100.3 mile an hour average. Wow, that's incredible. And how did you I mean, so how did you just speed everywhere or did you strategically pick the roads or how did you do it? A little bit of both. Obviously, there was a lot of strategy involved, a lot of problems to solve. And it's kind of a fun, multivariable equation that for me at the time, I was the director of sales at Lamborghini Atlanta. So it was kind of an awesome way to express myself, a personal branding project, but also this sort of decade long, you know, passion project to attach myself to. And it's an interesting group of people that still care about this as an idea. But, you know, we had three radar detectors and two laser jammers and an ambulance traffic light changer, a police scanner, CV radio, three navigation systems and everything you could ever have to avoid detection in such a drive. That's so funny. OK, VinWiki, what's the company doing? How do you make money? So it's a social vehicle history reporting platform. So we kind of describe it as like a crowdsourced version of Carfax. So we let anybody post any information to any car by its VIN or by its license plate. And it was really grown out of just a group of friends that I used to get together with and kind of talk about different entrepreneurial ideas. And they were mostly developers and had some bandwidth and they were looking for a project. And I talked about some of the ways that I had sold cars and managed the perception of their value while at the dealership and through the rental car company and just trying to show different ways to add value and kind of curate the history of a car so that you achieve whatever outcome you wanted. And Carfax, you know, is preached, you know, in Super Bowl commercials as the gospel truth of vehicle history. But that's not necessarily the case. And anyone who's been in the industry or really used it understands that it's not all that valuable. Certainly, there's a demand to have cars that have good looking Carfax reports, but that's more from a consumer perspective that's you know, probably uneducated than from a dealer perspective, there's not that much sensitivity there. And so we were just looking for a way to empower stakeholders and uh, we seem to have done it. And how do you make money? We don't. And uh, I understand that, you know, obviously in the world of social and tech startups, that's kind of a, a touchy subject. Right now, we actually make money off of YouTube. And that's kind of a fortuitous happenstance that began about a year ago. We started a marketing initiative of just me and my friends sitting around in my warehouse telling car stories. And we started using that to sort of evangelize the platform because what we were seeing is that it was growing nicely, maybe one or two percent a week, but not necessarily getting. How do you hold on, Ed? Sorry, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves. What do you mean growing? So grow if you don't have revenue, what is the growth standard? Growing more users. Okay, and how do you define a user? Uh, Someone who registers and posts in the app. Okay, got it. And and let's before we get too detailed here, put this on a timeline for me. When did you launch the company? Launched the company in January of sixteen. Released the app in June of sixteen. And then we started the YouTube channel about a year later, June of 17. Okay. And so now on YouTube, so the YouTube channel, uh, you know, is it general, what is it? Ad dollars, basically? It is. So on the 21st of each month, Google sends you a check that you can kind of interpret from views and time watched and things like that. But that grew very quickly. So it took us in a, in the last 12 months from 4,500 users in our app to over 85,000. And now it generates with about 420,000 subscribers and half a million views a day, 25 to 30 grand a month in revenue. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Now, is that the only revenue you're using to support the company or have you raised capital? That's all we're using right now. We've looked at different opportunities to, you know, run a big angel round or seed round or even move towards a series A. And we're kind of at that crossroads now. Well, we're not exactly sure. We've always known that VinWiki works better as a special sauce on t- on top of a larger automotive data platform than it probably does on its own. I mean, it's a great thing. And we've had a lot of interest in acquisition kind of throughout the last two years from different automotive data companies and just trying to understand exactly, you know, what the best fit is going to be. So we're kind of constantly jostling back and forth between whether or not it's worth going ahead with an earlier stage acquisition, pre-scale, or just continuing to grow, bring on more funding, continue to develop the app and increase engagement. So what's your team size today? 
Uh, it's me and I've got four developers that kind of work part time. So I'm the only full time employee. Are they all there in Atlanta? They are. Yep. Oh, great. Good tech, vill- tech village home. Not really, because we've all got a lot of cars, so we actually have an office a little bit north of town that has a lot of space to store fun things. Ah, very good. Okay, good. So, okay, five folks total, you plus four part-time developers. And so the it's, I think probably the best way to use the rest of our time on this is actually talk about YouTube. So if you're making 30 grand, 40 grand a month from YouTube ads, I mean, I would that probably puts you in the top 10%, I would say, of all YouTubers, maybe top 5%. So walk me through how you structure the videos, how you keep up with the daily cadence, Sure. So we release a new video every day and usually they're five to 10 minutes each. And again, it's either me or one of my friends telling some interesting car story. Today, we had a San Bernardino County Sheriff that came on and told their most epic car theft recovery story. And it just varies from different things that we do. And they all have done very, very well. And it was really just an experiment. I don't follow a lot of company social media platforms or you know accounts, but Uh, people very quickly started to really enjoy them. And fortunately, it was converting to a lot more growth in our app. So with the other kind of Instagram, Facebook paid marketing that we were doing, you know, again, we were growing by one or two percent, a few users a week. Now, you know, we're growing by that a day and it's sustained and continued. So we've grown in just over a year to about 425,000 subscribers. And again, it varies, but about 500,000 views a day. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I'm seeing thumbnail kind of headlines here. Help help pay your daughter's rent, an indecent proposal from an Uber driver, my first uh, car stolen and stripped, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, who's doing the copywriting? Is that all you? Mostly me. Yeah. So we have uh, ways for people to submit stories and we get new content each day. And I do most of the editing. I actually had a friend kind of help me start with it that does a lot of video editing because I didn't have a background in that. But you know, it was just kind of the perfect storm of a uh, way that not only supports us a bit financially now, but also allows us to, uh, you know, have a less than free profitable marketing uh, avenue. Yeah. I mean, look, <clears throat> I want to dive into that for a second, because I mean, publishing six to 10 minute videos every single day to YouTube. I mean, that takes that's that's like especially consistently that takes a lot of time and energy. Right. So what are your call in costs per video? Well, it's really just my time, but it is a full time job at this juncture because, you know, generally, as you know, if you're trying to produce quality video content, you're going to spend all in about an hour per minute. And since we've got it kind of templated at this point, I can do it a bit less than that, but it's still three or four hours to produce each video. And then you've got to engage with the audience and do other things that YouTubers, I suppose, do. And although I never set out to become a professional YouTuber, that seems to be something that's kind of happened. So you're doing all the editing. I am. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and when you record with these folks, the, the guests that you come on, walk me through what that happens. I mean, do they literally, you're sitting in a big orange office. Do they literally fly in, sit down with you when you shoot it? Or I mean, how's that work? They do. And if I turn my screen around, the other half of my office now has become our video set. And Got so it. it's a, uh, yeah, we, they come in and we've got kind of, as you see, an automotive themed background and we invite them just to tell their stories. And the great thing about it is that not only does it always help our company to be kind of evangelized in this way, because each story is sort of like a blown up post that someone might put into the app. It's a, some, you know, an interesting moment in a car's life, an interesting moment in an owner's life and how that all intersects. And that's really the type of content that we want to create. We're not necessarily looking to duplicate Carfax, AutoJack, you know, all the stuff that Cox Automotive would be able to compile in a car. We want to give a voice to the people that might not normally be able to express that type of information. You have sponsors. Lux Rally was on one of your recent ones. Is this another revenue model? It is, yeah. So in addition to the revenue we get from uh, Google through YouTube, AdSense, whatever you want to call it, that, you know, that that's usually 20 to 25 grand a month. And then on top of that, we sell that monthly placement at the moment for about 10 grand. Oh, great. Okay. And then what about, you know, when you're driving traffic back to your store to buy your t-shirts and things, does gear do well for you? Pretty well. I think we do better than average on that front, but it's still only a few grand a month. So, okay. you know, even at a pretty decent profit margin, that's not a huge amount to write home about yet. That's interesting. Here's what I appreciate so far about this story. And a lot of our listeners are, are software guys so and gals. So I think they can take some lessons from this. You've essentially been able to underwrite your free application by essentially monetizing your distribution channels, right? Through things that are not related to selling your core product, which is interesting. Precisely. Some people would argue, well, he's not focused, but others might say, well, no, he's actually very efficient because he's never had to raise and it's a great channel and it's driving incredible growth of the app for free, essentially. 
Right. And since we still don't know precisely where the end game of the VinWiki app is, whether it is an acquisition by one of the major players, you know, your Cox, Experian, IHS market, or if it's to continue to grow itself, this at least prolongs our runway. And that's really what the game is of early tech startup entrepreneurship is how long can I allow this idea to develop? Because the longer I let that happen, the clearer I'm going to see what it needs to become. How do you measure um, stickiness of the application? We're usually the same way most people would, monthly or daily active users. And those numbers are pretty good, but we're really still in a 1.0 phase of the app. So we're kind of even beyond a 90-10 user contribution you know, measure where our really, really passionate users are way more passionate than we ever imagined they would be posting 100 or 200 times a day. Whereas you know, if they were on Instagram or Facebook, a lot of the other places they might put their car enthusiast content it'd be considerably less than that. So not only we look at really two things, we look at our monthly active users and that's usually of 85,000 users right now, it's going to be 30 to 40,000 monthly active. But then when we look at- And that at means they just logged really, on at least once. Active, what's that? What does that oh, mean? Post at least once. They post at least post once. At least once. Okay. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, we're not just counting people that browse through the feed of information because obviously we want people more engaged. But we also really try to focus on how active our top 5% of users are because we're kind of like a big automotive forum or like Reddit or like Wikipedia where we're always going to rely on our most active users to provide the lion's share of the content. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So, so weekly active users, daily active users, you're measuring all that stuff. Uh, it's free right now. Um, you're doing sponsorship stuff through YouTube. You're doing some gear. You also have sponsorships on top of that. Walk me through that. Does YouTube, so other people listening right now that might have big YouTube channels or they maybe they are thinking about sponsors through their channels. I mean, is there any conflict of interest having Lux kind of built in yourself versus making Lux go through Google's platform to sponsor your show? No, it's a fairly common practice to use different sponsors to kind of support the effort. So we did it early on to kind of facilitate the cost of organizing the set, buying the equipment that we needed and things like that. And again, YouTube encourages branding partnerships. They've tried to set up interfaces that facilitate it, but it's a very, very kind of clunky system at the moment. Probably a good innovation opportunity for someone there. But just connecting, I suppose, influencers with a big air quote around it uh, with the brands that might want to use the publicity because in these cases, we can we generate so many impressions that are a little bit hard to exactly define, but it is a ton of traffic that goes wherever we kind of point it. So it's been a great kind of opportunity for us to form these kind of yeah, partnerships. How many clicks would one of your videos drive if the video gets 200,000 views? We've had different people monitor it in different ways, and obviously a lot of them are kind of targeted. So like, for instance, we had a, an upstart dealer auction platform that got 1,200 dealer signups in the course of the month of placement. So for 10 grand to have 1,200 qualified dealers sign up for their platform was obviously a hugely valuable thing. So it's varied a little bit because inevitably, most of these people are, are understanding that they they want access to a, a smaller portion of our broad audience. But it's pretty consistent with who uses our app as well. So it's going to be a nice eventual crossover there. Very good, Ed. All right, let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, what's your favorite business book? You know, I just read Sinek's book uh, that Leaders Eat Last, kind of based on one of his recent TED Talks. I enjoyed that one as I'm constantly trying to motivate teams of developers. Number two, uh, is there a CEO that you're following or studying right now? Um, You know, I've actually enjoyed uh, David Payne a lot from Switchyards here in Atlanta. He started Scout Mob and launched this kind of tech incubator or hub, and he's been a hugely helpful advisor for us. Number three, what's your favorite online tool for building your business? Obviously, YouTube. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, number I had a, I had a suspicion that might be the case. Number four, how many hours of sleep do you get every night? About seven, actually. Okay, and what's your situation? Married, single, kiddos? Married. I got a four year old son and a boa constrictor. Okay, okay, good. So one and a half kids there. And how old are you, Ed? I'm uh, thirty two. Thirty two. Last question: What do you wish your twenty year old self knew? Just do everything you did. <laughs> do, do everything you did. Guys, there you have it from Ed. Again, got into VinWiki in 2016. Uh, think of it, you know, a much a better version of a CarMax or or one of these sites essentially is a wiki or a or a WordPress or kind of a, a system where people to upload and go in and update their records related to all these cars. What's interesting here, I think, is the growth channel, right? So YouTube uh, as a growth channel scales one 10 minute video per day, bringing in anywhere between 20 and 30 grand per month and just ad spend. And then also does branded partnerships with folks like Lux, which is another 10 grand per month. He's essentially underwritten all of the growth of his application, which is now up to 85,000 users uh, through these marketing channels. So Ed, congratulations. Thank you so much for taking us to the top. 
Thank you, sir.